Hello, and welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brooklyn Business, featuring Lana Harper in conversation with Rachel Harrison to celebrate the launch of From Bad to Curse. Um, my name is Bonnie, and I am a bookseller at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you're familiar with our store, welcome back. Um, and if this is your first time hearing about us, welcome. It's so lovely to have you join our community this evening. And we appreciate your support of both of our authors and an independent bookstore through your purchases and attendance. Now to introduce our authors, uh, our moderator tonight, Rachel Harrison, was born and raised in the weird state of New Jersey, home of the Jersey Devil. Uh, she received her bachelor's in writing for film and television from Emerson College. After graduating, she worked on TV game shows in publishing and for a big bank. She lives in Western New York with her husband and their cat Flash Overlord. Our author tonight, Lana Harper, is the New York Times bestselling author of Payback the Witch and the newly released From Bad to Curse from Berkeley Books. Lana studied psychology and literature at Yale University, law at Boston University, and is a graduate of the Emerson College Publishing and Writers Master's, Master's Program. She was born in Serbia and lived in Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania before moving to the United States where she now lives in Chicago with her family. Um, and to tell you all a little bit about the book, uh, our protagonist, wild child, Isadora Arap Avramov, am I saying that right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is a thrill chaser, adept demon summer, summoner, and despite the whole sexy evil sorceress vibe, also a cuddly, an cuddly animal lover. When someone starts sabotaging the Beltane Festival with dark magic, she is forced to work together with her sworn arch nemesis Rowan, the very definition of lawful good, so tragically noble and by the book, he makes Issa's teeth hurt, only for the two to discover that they have a maddening attraction for each other. We love a good enemies to lovers romance, and I personally can't wait to hear Lana talk more about the book. It is such a pleasure to have you both here tonight. Everybody, please make some noise in the chat for Lana and Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. We were talking about this earlier, but I, I'm so excited to be launching with the Brookline Booksmith, which was my very favorite indie for a lot of years. And I'm especially excited to be doing it with Rachel. So thank you so much for chatting with me. I'm so excited because <laughs> I love this book. It is witty and sexy and funny and spooky, and there's a lot of heart in it. And I want to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So the thing no one tells you about summoning demons is <laughs> sometimes you have to think outside the box. What a great opening line and a perfect introduction to our protagonist, Isadora Avramov, um, Isa. She is fun and badass and hilarious um, and very layered. So this is the second book in a series. When you started writing, did you always have her in mind as your protagonist? And did she develop in ways that surprised you? So thank you uh, for loving her because I adore her. She is so far my probably my favorite character that I've ever written. Um, and I did absolutely plan to write the second book. I didn't know exactly who it was going to be up until I got to a certain scene in Payback. And then I was like, you know, what would be awesome is if Talia had a sister, because then I could do an Avramov book after this one, which was um, always the plan for me. So I knew that I wanted to write the Avramovs um, immediately after the Harlows, just because their magic is like hands down the most fascinating to me. I think any kind of like necromancy speaking to the dead is really interesting. And I wanted to make it like not gross, but sexy, <laughs> which is like kind of a tall order. Cause it's like, normally you're like, oh, necromancer is disgusting. Like they're just like sitting around raising dead bodies. And I was like, no, I wanted to be something very different um, and more layered and kind of hopefully more compelling. Um, but Issa herself, like once I knew that she was going to be kind of this like offbeat, uh, fashion-y person, which I knew from, from the first book, I had a sense of who I thought she was going to be. She wound up being both considerably like wilder than Talia and wilder than I thought she was going to be. And then also a lot more vulnerable. So I didn't 
know until I started writing that I wanted to very kind of very deeply explore the mental health aspect, because one of the things that happens in a lot of genre books is like, if you do touch on mental health, it's usually like, oh, this character is such a badass. They've been through difficult experiences. They have PTSD or like they have an anger problem. They have like certain kinds of mental health issues that are designated as like, it's okay to have those and still be a badass. Whereas something like, oh, you have just underlying anxiety and panic attacks, like you know, that's not necessarily cool. Like, that's just like, those things don't go hand in hand with being like a badass demon, like demon summoning sorceress who like does a lot of thrill seeking for fun. So I just wanted to create this heroine that I would have wanted to read back when I was like having panic attacks as a 12 year old and never seeing any of that in books. So that aspect um, really developed over the course of writing the book. Um, and I didn't no, starting out that I wanted her to, to be having this identity crisis with her family um, where she loves them so much and they're so tight knit and supportive, but I wanted it to be clear that she's like, you know what, this is like becoming stifling for me. I want to do my own thing. So she was very, in some ways she was super unpredictable. And in other ways I was just like, ah, yeah, like, I just want to write this like real badass Abramov and like, hopefully, hopefully I somewhat pull that up. You did. Cause I, as you were talking, I was like, she is a very complex character she you know has like the badass side to her and then she kind of keeps her vulnerability very close to the chest um and so it kind of unfurls over the course of the book in a very interesting but also inherent way nothing felt forced nothing felt like um you know it was ticking off a box she felt like a wholly realized person and oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That makes so good. Thanks. She's a phenomenal protagonist and I'm excited for everybody else to meet her. Um, and I'm wondering because, you know, it, it's hard to have any character feel mm-hmm. real and to have all these different aspects and pull it off. And um, then we have Rowan, who to me also feels very developed and whole. And, you know, it's also easy for like romantic interests to kind of get the, like, be a little bit flat. And he's absolutely not. And I was wondering, heading into writing this book, did you know that you wanted him to be the love interest? Um, And if so, did he also develop in any ways that surprised you? Yes. So yes to both. I did know it was always going to be Ethan Rowan. That was very clear to me from, from book one. Um, And I didn't know it was uh, the part that was really fun for me was I didn't know what, what the sort of like hilarious foundation for their arch nemesis ship was going to be until I started writing it. Then I was like, one, I want this to be serious in a real way because the two of them are such polar opposites. I mean, she's a thrill seeker. She's chaotic neutral. She's you know, down to summon demons. Um, but she also loves animals, even though she does death magic. And then he's the absolute opposite of that, where he's just so bought into his own like green magic, very lawful, good identity that, um, it was clear to me like that, that tension between them was going to be awesome. Like it was going to be the kind of sparks that I like the best where it's like, we genuinely do not like each other. Like, this is not like, oh, we've been kind of, although to be fair, like we know from the beginning that she thinks he's super hot and like, it's, it's assumed to be mutual, but the dislike and the real, um, kind of, a tension between the two, their identities is, it was prominent for me. And I wanted it to also showcase kind of Abramov's versus Thorns. So it was an easy sort of thing where it's like these families already have so many issues and so much history. So that gave me like this entry into exploring um, like a different facet of Thistle Grove than I had in the first book. Um, But as I started writing them, it was the way that it developed was interesting and that I hadn't thought that Rowan was going to be like a surprisingly edgy guy in some ways. Like I didn't think he was going to be like necessarily tossing Issa against storefronts. Like I didn't think it was going to be that kind of um, very, very, very fiery romance between them. Um, And there's a moment down the line where he talks about his hobbies and it's surprising to her because, you know, she cares about the environment. So does he obviously, but he also has certain like low key thrill seeking tendencies. And so those things were the kinds of things that you discover about a person when you're like, okay, maybe you're not who I thought you were. Maybe we both let our guard down a little bit. It. So a lot of those things were organic for me. It wasn't planned. I didn't, I didn't think, um, I didn't know what their kind of uh, points of intersection were going to be until I got there. 
I like that you mentioned that it's fiery because this book gets fiery. <laughs> um, and I am a sucker for enemies to lovers, like the like, mm-hmm. will they, won't they? I know they're going to, just a matter of when. Um, do you have any favorite enemies to lovers in yeah, the so- in the whole <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do in the universe. I have a lot of them. Um, the ones that immediately come to mind are Emily Henry's. So I actually think her first and her third book are both kind of twists on enemies to lovers. In the first book, it's Gus and January and they're like competing writers and she writes genre fiction romance and he writes literary fiction and they're so sparky. That was when I read it and I was like, oh yeah, like this is something I would like to do one day. And then in book lovers, which just came out, um, she's uh, a very sharky literary agent and he's this like cutthroat editor and so they immediately get off on the wrong foot and it's the same kind of thing um so I wanted to lean into something like that but the other part of it that I find interesting is like when you have enemies to lovers in a forced partnership situation where it's like polar opposites who have to do stuff together so there I wanted kind of the like a uh, Scully and Mulder vibes Cause they had like those two, I, I'm pretty sure like those two together were like the total sum of my sexual awakening. Cause I was like, Oh God, so hot. Which one? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was part of it was the fact that like, they were always on opposite sides of everything to the point where it was like, Scully, like, like maybe there are aliens, like all of us are kind of, on- yeah. he, he wins a lot. Like maybe you should possibly start believing <laughs> him. But that was one of my, I feel like, formative viewing experiences. Um, And there's also, I forget what the name of the partner was, but it's in Issa Rae's actually in Insecure. Uh, Molly and her eventual partner start out as like rival attorneys in the same law firm. Like they really genuinely don't like each other for a number of seasons, actually. So it's like a very slow burn. And I really like when that happens, like where you really buy into like these people like hate each other's guts like there's no way they're gonna they're gonna end up like getting together but then you kind of know that they will so it's like that anticipation I think is really fun yeah I want to because you were talking about slow burn and I think something I was super into about this book was the the romantic pacing was perfect and I think it's tricky when writing like a steamy book with a romance element especially and also in enemies to lovers to be able to pace it out so the readers do have that belief in the beginning that they genuinely don't like each other and then get a hint at the right time that something might happen, but then also not like give too much too quickly because then Mm -hmm. the anticipation is gone and the anticipation is like the sexy fun part. So how did you go about like writing this romance in a way that like the pace would be satisfying? Thank you for telling me that (laughs) because I definitely did a lot of second guessing while I was writing it. Um, And I'm, I'm very lucky to have a critique group and they're really, really good at being like, okay, like you're giving too much ground. They like each other too quickly, like pull back in this respect or like take a little bit more time with it. Um, Part of it was just the fact that I realized that sometimes you can have progress, but then walk it back. And there is a scene where the two of them, like, get really up close and personal and then it's like actually very ouchy right after because one of them changes their mind about like was that a good idea and so I think you you just have these like little hacks where you can allow yourself to do that plus you you're in the head of one of these people and you know from the very beginning that like this guy sucks he's the worst he's like my polar opposite but like he has the best jaw and like his lower lip is really ridiculous and so it's just you know it's easy to kind of slip that stuff in even as you're building kind of the the foundation yeah. for their antagonism plus there's like the neat hack of being able to be like these families have coexisted uncomfortably for a very long time because their magics are inherently opposite um, and they just they're not compatible and you wouldn't imagine that they would ever be compatible as as people so even if members of the families maybe found each other attractive you still have that weight of like the history between them weighing them down so I just try to think of it as like all right like you have to advance the attraction a little bit in every scene but they're 
you, you need to wait until at least halfway to two thirds of the book before you get to the tipping points. Yeah. And that's what I was kind of trying to do, but it was, it was definitely feeling it out. And there were scenes where they got too friendly and my critique group was like, you got to tone down this, like, we're cool now. So, like, this is not, this is not it. Like <laughs> they have to continue kind of doing the sassy sniping at each other for a little bit longer. So it was, it was more of a work in progress than, cause I'd never done enemies to lovers. Uh, and so it was, it was very, like, I had always wanted to, but it was super new to me so I'm glad that I did it in a satisfying way <laughs> it was executed to perfection thank you in my opinion um and in addition to the romantic element and kind of the more like sexy lighthearted um part of the book it's really high stakes in terms of the central mystery I mean like necromantic curses and like gets into some like dark magic and heaviness and it's scary and I was wondering how you went about balancing it and also there's this like kind of Scully and Mulder-esque crime solving element to it and so I'm always interested about creating the balance and also how writers approach constructing a mystery because I don't know how to do it so (laughs) Somebody tell me. <laughs> oh, man, I also, so I was like, when I started planning this book, I knew I needed like a central instigating event the way that the gauntlet served for payback. But I was like, well, we did a competition, right? Like that happened. So what's an equally maybe even more propulsive element? And the first thing that occurred to me was like, okay, there's a mystery. What would be an obvious mystery? Well, like what if one of the families there was a curse and it was fairly obvious who would have had said curse. And I can't remember exactly when I was like, oh, it should be a necromantic curse, but probably it came fairly early on just because I was like, I want it to be about the Abramovs. Yeah. It's not like the thorns are going to be cursing yeah. them. That seems highly unlikely. And so once I had that nailed down, I was like, okay, well, which, because we had um, Halloween Samhain for payback. And I'm like, you know, I'd really like to anchor it in another wheel of the year holiday. Let's do Beltane. Beltane is all fire, fertility, life. Like it's such a lush kind of thorn holiday. Um, and I was like, well, what if Abramoff's just really messed with that somehow? So um, that's where the idea came from. And then I was like, okay, so you set up a mystery but like, you don't know how to write a mystery. Like I definitely had a moment where I was like, what are they going to do? <laughs> like, what is the plot? Uh, <laughs> I guess they have to solve stuff. So like they need clues, right? And then I was like, literally I, I watched an episode of NCIS and I was like, oh, okay. First they go to the scene of the crime and then they investigate. And so I did that. And then I tried to make it like a little bit funny and meta and had Issa be like, I love those shows. I actually don't like NCIS. So in that she and I are totally different. I'm a CSI person, but um, um, once I started doing it, I was like, well, this is a paranormal mystery. So like, obviously they're going to use magic. Like they're not going to send specimens off to labs. Like what they're going to do is do cool spells. And then once I realized that I could just do cool spells, that became an obvious kind of way where it was like, okay, so either what's going to be happening is we're going to be getting closer to resolving the mystery, either through a magical moment or like a procedural moment where we're talking to a witness and then in those moments where it was like a more human element then I was like okay I can take advantage of this scene by allowing the two of them to talk to each other and get closer and discover more about each other so it was like it was almost like every scene had to do more than one thing or like two or three things like way more stuff than normally is the case like it just it was a lot of kind of heavy lifting per scene in a fun way because it's like fun when you can multi-purpose stuff in that sense but I I did spend a lot of time trying to think of like okay like has it been too long since they almost kissed like should I have them almost kiss again um so it's it's great I'm glad I, I was attempting to sort of please the people that I knew were going to be there more for the mystery, the way that some readers were there more for the gauntlet, but then also make sure that the readers who were just there for the smooches were like, all right, like we're getting fed too. It's fine. <laughs> like we're not bored. We're not sitting here doing CSI all the time. So I'm glad it felt that like it was balanced because it was one of my main struggles. It was difficult to try to get it in that sweet spot. I think you're right. And having every scene do multiple things, mm-hmm. like it wasn't like one scene was super dark and then the next scene was sexy. It was every scene you had the element of like a little bit of tension between them and like 
something like dark is going on and like, we have to solve what's how to like figure this out together. And so it, it was all, every line pulled through the whole book. So I think that was good to, to balance and, um, Tonally, I think you nailed it. Thank you. Um, well, my favorite, actually, my favorite scene in the book without any spoilers is that one scene where they're like getting really hot and heavy. And then it's like, oh no, necromantic curse. He's like, yeah. save him now. <laughs> where it's like, oh, I've got to get my boob back in my dress. I mean, I have- <laughs> even that felt like it felt natural yeah. where it felt like we're getting interrupted, but because we're in this world, we're getting interrupted by this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, that, that was kind of, that was kind of always the plan where it's like, you know, well, if we're going to do the classic tropes of like, oh, they're making out stuff's going to happen. Like it's really going to happen. It's like, well, or like a death set might show up <laughs> and try to eat the green healer. As they do. <laughs> As they do, I'm sure. Um, and you also mentioned Beltane, which I want to talk about because Mm-hmm. It's such a, it's a fun event and you got to be like a magical event planner so I'm wondering like what elements did you pull in from real life and mm-hmm. what was like fantasy wish fulfillment of like if I was in Thistle Grove this is what I'd want to do most of it yeah, yeah. that's really what Thistle Grove is like 98% wish fulfillment for me so I've only really celebrated one Beltane with actual like real life uh, Wicca practitioners and it was lovely and that's where the idea of spring wine came from because that's what we drank and it was really nice um, it did not have uh, similar revivifying effects as the wine that they drank um, in the book but then I was like okay so I can't have it be just one day I have to have it be a series of events. Otherwise the stakes will be lower because this mystery will only really affect a single day. And that's like, right. not really cool. So I was like, well, what if they make it super extra? Cause everything is larger anyway in Thistle Grove. So like, you know, it's a, it's the kind of fiery shenanigans filled, sexy sort of um, festival that could take place over the course of a month. Like you could conceivably stretch it out a little bit more. And then I started thinking like, well, what things could happen because the real life Beltane or the way that um, a lot of neo-pagans and Wiccans celebrate it is it's a fire and fertility and light festival. um, And it's between it falls right between like a solstice and an equinox. And so it's basically just like, okay, we're bringing back in the light. A lot of couples tend to get hand fast during that. So there's the bonfires, lots of flowers, the maypole, like very phallic kind of symbolism. So I was like, all right, this is going to be a sexy moment to place it in. So what if I did like, um, like an audition, essentially, like there's always a queen and a green man, the May queen and the green man are real things that happen even in like, um, genuine celebrations of Beltane. So I was like, how could we elevate that into something really interesting? Um, And then the dance of the maidens just sounded really fun. And I was super bummed that it didn't get to happen because I thought it was going to happen. And then I was like, oh yeah, no, we're going to have to skip that one all together. And then first do was, um, we had gotten to a part of the book where I was like, not enough magic has happened essentially. We need something for the entire community to be able to do that's magical. So we all remember we're in a witch book. Like the stuff that's been happening so far has been either mystery or sexy. And like, I want a big witch moment. And so that was first do when the substitute May Queen leads them up the hill and they do all that cool stuff. And then um, I needed like a pivotal kind of moment for Issa and Rowan at the end. And I was like, what could be cooler than like a massive bonfire that was magical and like far too large. So it was just me thinking like, well, if I could live the coolest Beltane that also served narrative purposes, how would I make it happen? That also served narrative purposes. Yeah, I, mean, I to- love that. <laughs> it, like always, so- kind of pragmatic. Yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah, that it was intentional, you yeah. know. Yeah, that's a tr- spoken like a true writer. <laughs> <laughs> Wish fulfillment that <laughs> serves narrative purpose. You know, it makes it sound so unromantic, but it's like, we got to get the job done, right? Like, yeah, it's still work. <laughs> it's still work, yeah. Um, Thistle Grove, I just like, can't get over how real it feels and how fully realized and... I wondered, like, I think you've mentioned it kind of does come naturally to you. Um, But in this, as for like a second book in the series, did you ever, was it tricky to expand the universe or were you just like, this is my playground? 
I love it here. It's a total playground moment. I have never felt this way about any other world that I've invented where like, it's just so fun because it's intentionally campy. And so I can do anything I want, which is awesome. Like normally you don't just have like carte blanche to be like, make a tacky. It's going to be great. And in this case, I get to do that. And um, the reason I wanted this to be the second book was because I really wanted the darker side to be more prominent. Um, And I had set up, like we all knew that the Avramovs had the Arcane Emporium and the Haunted House in the first book, but I deliberately didn't have any action set there because I wanted to save it. Um, so I was just like, this is going to be your moment. Like you love arcane emporiums, like, and you know, because you've been to Salem, like the kinds of stores that they have there. I was thinking like, what if you had this, but on Walmart scale, it was just so full of witchy shit. That would be amazing. Um, and then of course, you know, like someone has to run it, like people are sourcing all this stuff. And then for the haunted house, I was really excited to bring that into the plot in this like kind of meta but like slightly cheesy purposefully way because I thought it would be fun for Issa to have that as like a therapeutic tool where she could work out her feelings (laughs) by inventing a storyline that was like functionally echoing what was happening during real life but a lot of it is like um I think Um, Unlike with a lot of my other settings, I have a really clear visual of what it looks like as a town. Like I know where things are. I remember the names of the different stores. And so it just, it's like having like a weird like Sims in my head of this one place. (laughs) Because normally I'm terrible at any kind of geospatial stuff, but like this little grove is my one exception. Like I I know what's there. I love that. That's so special. I wish like I can visualize it, but I know it like is different in your head. Yeah. I wish I could like <laughs> I wish I could draw existing. or like huh? I like I if I was an artist or I had any kind of like really any creative skills that we're not writing I don't I am not like I can't draw I can't do anything like I'm not a musician but I, I I would love to be able to do something else awesome with it and actually a friend of mine um drew this beautiful picture of Issa and Rowan during their moment um in the witch woods so I'm gonna share that uh down the line at some point but I was like I wish I could do what you do because there are so many things that I would like to to draw in that world, which feels like very arrogant because I made it, but it feels like no. it exists outside of me. <laughs> I there are some places that are just special, and I think we know as writers when we tap into something special, mm-hmm. and then as a reader, yeah. it's very clear when some place is special, and Thistle Grove is special. Mm-hmm. So, it me tingles. I really uh, love it. Thank you. It's just I. I love it. I <laughs> really like the shamrock cauldron because I love a skeleton and a top hat named Dead Frederick. I was like, this is my place. I want to grab a drink here. I'm all about it. Dead Frederick was one of the first things I was like, there's going to be a skeleton. He's going to be called Dead Frederick. I don't know why. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. He's going to love to come from. And Marta grab eats and have a ukulele. And that's what it is. It's just what it is. Yeah. Um, so he's like, uh, the Shamrock Cauldron actually has a much larger part to play in the third book. Because, uh, yeah, the romance is between, this is just off topic, but because you were ta- because we're chatting about it anyway, it's Morty Gutierrez. Um, and Nina Blackmore so which is like a wild pairing but I was like I have to spend like a lot more time there and like possibly have a sex scene in that bar. Dead Frederick cover your socket <laughs> you can't see this dude look yeah um, I love it I'm glad you like it too because it's like everything I ever wanted in a bar it's like tacky it's really loud there's psychedelic decorations the drinks are all themed like what more could you want Themed drinks and tacky <laughs> in there. Um, do you have a favorite place in Thistle Grove? Ooh, that's a hard one. So it's a strong toss up between the haunted house and Castle Camelot, actually, because I'm pretty sure if I were going to Thistle Grove, I would go to Castle Camelot first and spend like two days there. <laughs> have you ever to- been to an immersive haunted house? Um, not a haunted house per se. And apparently there are some in Illinois and I will be doing that this Halloween, but I've been to like, um, there was a place, um, I think in Vermont called the witch woods and it was an outdoor immersive haunted house. So you got to like go through pine trees. It was normally a ski resort and they just like repurposed it for Halloween and had like 
truly very convincing actors because I remember being like I'm scared like this is making me genuinely uncomfortable and I'm not cool with it and then I loved it the next day but what I, when it's like, over you can love it yeah, you're like, oh, yeah that was awesome would totally do again and not be paying myself uh and then there was um sleep no more in New York which is like um super immersive huge like retrofitted warehouse that has um tons of rooms that you can explore by yourself but what you're supposed to do is follow the actors and they're like there's no spoken word it's all just like they're dancing and acting it out and there's like an orgy with a with a bowl it's wild it's just like the most intense thing that i've ever that i've ever seen and the audience gets drawn into it so it's um the basic idea is it's macbeth but it's like a noir at the same time so the aesthetic is very dark and at some point i was like running around after them and i followed the macbeth witches so much that um after the bloody orgy one of them had me wipe her down with a towel and i was like this is the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> I'm so glad that I get to do this. So I was like, well, if you had that, like a massive warehouse, but the whole thing was this very elaborately themed, like plotted out, intricate haunted house. Um, what would that look like? That would be super cool. Yeah. I lived in New York for like a decade and I never went to sleep no more <gasps> because I'm like not about the interacting. The, you um, don't have to though, if you don't want to, because you're all wearing the weird plague doctor masks and you can just like chill like I saw people wander into rooms and just like not come out <laughs> yeah that would have been me I would have been like wedged in my <laughs> leg nose in a corner just like you're like I'm sorry I can't but there's so many, there's like the indoor orchard there's like indoor asylum there's so many places where you can just like there was one room that was like a mad scientist's office and for a while I just like opened drawers and was like what's in here what that is part I like it's the yeah. like actors who are like pretend like it's mm. the other if it was empty I'm an introvert oh, yeah. if it was empty I would have had the best time <laughs> but because there were other people there I would have been like totally fair and <laughs> it's also dark right and you're running around and I, I for a while I was like they should have a sign waivers because like I definitely bumped into stuff and was like ouch that like really hurt my shin I didn't appreciate what happened here. yeah I'm surprised that they got it because usually in New York City they're like sign here you have to sign mm -hmm. NDAs to go to a speakeasy but exactly <laughs> yeah but I feel like you should try it because you can totally hide and the actors are already like we're like half naked and we're just like attempting to have you guys not grow up us like please don't do that because it's creepy so they're never going to be interacting with someone who's not right. just like been hanging with them the whole entire plot line so it's very much like obviously I'm an extrovert and intro everyone can enjoy it all the Myers yeah. types can find something <laughs> Maybe I'd go in Thistle Grove. Maybe. Which, if if you were planning a day trip, like what would be your perfect day trip in Thistle Grove? Oh, okay. So I thought about this. Um, I would like to start on the main street because there's so many things to do. And it's like, okay, we'll kick it off with Tomes and Omens because they have all the cool books. You can get kind of a witchy feel, get a little bit of the history. Um, and then like, do like a little food tour because there's so many different foods on that street and then once you're done with that um cryptid pizza is one that I think comes up later and I was like yes I would love um a place that like has themed pizza because there was a place a little bit like that in Salem um and then I would definitely go to the haunted house maybe to um no, it's like I would skip the orchards because I would have to spend a lot of time at Castle Camelot, like a lot of time because I'd have to do a joust, like watch the performance, eat at least three different meals there. So I feel like it would be like two thirds, one third other stuff and then two thirds Castle Camelot because it's like low key my favorite place in the town, which is awful because it's Blackmores and we all hate them. But I love anything medieval and like Renaissance fairies. Yeah. I was like, what if that were an entire castle and like indoor and outdoor? That would be really fun. Yeah. Where would you go? Well, let's see if I make it out of the shamrock cauldron. Well, but in the event, in the event that you didn't just drink seven drinks. I'll cast yeah. Castle Camelot. Yeah, oh, I really I love like medieval stuff too. There's a I just discovered there's um like a big Renaissance fair up here in, in western New York. So I have to get out there this summer. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, there's some here too, and I'm just like, I need friends. To to me because <laughs> I require a retinue of dress it's just gonna be me in like one of those like <laughs> hat the with like the veil coming down and like a turkey leg 
just like wandering around as happy as a clam. <laughs> like how, how could it possibly get me better if you do do it that way? Like, I hope you take a million pictures. <laughs> So I want to see that. Me and my turkey leg. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> Going through the stocks. <laughs> <laughs> but always with the turkey leg. Yeah. I feel like there's tons of, there'd be tons of fun photo ops in Thistle mm-hmm. Grove. So many. Um, I mean, really, it's just like one massive photo op. Like, yeah. <laughs> designed for like, what if your whole Instagram was just Thistle Grove? <laughs> like, Keep the influencers influencers out or else you would never get to do anything fun. ever, ever, which is like Salem. Like that's the issue with Salem where you're like so much cool stuff is happening. Oh my God. There's like 800 people here taking pictures of themselves. Like, yeah. Winning it. There's like a line to take it with the, be with the, the, um, statue. Mm-hmm. Statue. Um, though I do have pictures with them. So do I. Yeah. You, have, you just have to, I'm sorry. Like it's, it's mandatory. But we're all part of the problem. Um, if you were to go on this day trip to Thistle Grove, mm-hmm. who would you, like, if you could hang out with one person for the day, who would you hang out with? Oh, this is hard. Elena Abramov. Yeah. Yeah. I really like her. Yeah. She's like, I wish a little bit, I love my mom, but I sort of wish a little that she were my mom. Cause I find her so scary and interesting. Um, and also just like a fascinating person. Once you discover that she like broke with tradition and like built this like very capitalist thing. Um, yeah. and was like, okay, well we ran out of our like weird old Russian money and <laughs> we got to do something else. So I think it would be, I, I, I want to say it would be her. Um, but then I love, I love Talia so much that it would be like, if I could, if it could be both of them, I think. Just hang out with the family. Yeah, exactly. It's just all of them, whatever, throw them all in. I want Micah too. And Adriana, all of them. Um, sorry. I'm making like you pick between your children. That's okay. I got one of your characters. Who would it be? (laughs) You're allowed to be cruel. You're supposed to be cruel. It's actually the writer job description. So that's, I appreciate it. (laughs) Keeping me honest. Um, and so this is the second book in a series. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you knew it was going to be a series pretty early on. Did you know mm-hmm. before you started writing Payback or while you were writing Payback? So I hoped that it would be a series when we pitched the proposal, but um, really when when Payback sold, it was only 100 pages in, um, but it sold as a three book deal. So it was like an implication that there would be two more books. Um, and I had soft pitched um, the books that are happening. So I, I knew that I wanted an Abramov story second. I knew that I wanted a Blackmore story third. Um, and I had the kind of rough ideas already sort of there and they changed a lot um, when I started writing them. But I did begin developing, like once it was sold, I was like, okay, you need this town to be large enough to like handle um, and give enough of a setting to all of these different, very, very different and tonally different stories. So it was helpful to keep it in mind. Like you need to keep it a little bit broader. Like it's not a tiny small town. Like it's still got that hallmarky feel, but it has to be big enough for like capacity. Yeah. Um, was there any challenge in writing the second book in a series? Anything that surprised you or were you just so excited to be back that it was like I loved writing. Uh, I want to say I I liked writing it more than I liked payback because I I was comfortable at that point. I was like, okay, you were confidently writing for adults now. And so I was in payback. I held back a little bit because I was like, I'm not sure like what's okay to say, how far can I go? What can I do? And then by the second book, I was like, yeah, we're doing this. Like, it's just, we're all adults here. It's fine. And so I just felt like I had much more leeway to play with what, you know, what strike me as more adult issues. There's still younger adult issues, like he was 10 years younger than I am. And so I, but I remember being in that, in that place a lot better than I remember being 17. And so it was, it felt like a really solid sort of emotional landscape. Um, and then also I was like, all right, well, this is like a beaten path now. Like I know what's going on here. Um, it was just, probably the, the most challenging thing was trying to depict panic attacks and kind of baseline anxiety in a way that came across as both authentic 
um, to the character and to the way that I experienced it, because, you know, everyone has those things to people who experience those things have very different manifestations of them. And I wanted it to be clear that these things don't hold her back, but that they're a big part of her life. And so I, I spent more time thinking about that than I had spent thinking about Emmy's issues. Cause Emmy was just like, ugh, you know, I'm back here. I don't really want to be back here, but I miss it. Like, it was just not the same um, kind of crisis that Issa was. So everything was like dialed up more right. in the second book. And that was, I found it easier to write because I just like melodramatic stuff. But I also like felt like it needed to be a little bit more thoughtful. Yeah. Well, it is thoughtful. And the stakes I feel like are higher in this book, which makes me curious because we're returning to Thistle Grove. Yeah. It's back in a spell. Yes. Mm-hmm. Can you tease a little bit about back in a spell before we get into some Q and A's? Yeah. So back in a spell is Nina Blackmore's story. Um, and she is in this like downtrodden space because she got basically ditched by her fiance at the altar uh, a year ago and she's not been able to move on. And so her best friend who is actually a normie. So we have two fairly main character, this little girl of normies in this book, which hasn't happened um, in the previous books, is like, what if you did a dating app? Um, and then she matches with Morty Gutierrez, who is, um, they're both actually pansexual, but he's also gender fluid. Um, and they embark on this very interesting magical discovery journey, because after their terrible first date, it's just like super awful, magic starts going like super haywire for Nina. She suddenly has these like wildly outsized powers. Um, and it turns out that so does Morty. Like he has developed uh, the kinds of powers that normally only happen to normies when they're witch bound to a witch partner, something that's been alluded to in the other books, but hasn't been explored. And so it's a little bit of a mystery in the sense of like, well, what's happening? Why is this happening to her magic? But it's much more of a really deep, traumatic, emotional journey for her because she has all this pain to unpack from her fiance and also her family is like profoundly dysfunctional and we really get into like why do the Blackmores suck so much so it's just um and we get like a large large piece of Thistle Grove magical history eventually revealed so it's like leveled up magic leveled up emotional trauma um I think to a place that I was nervous to go before with these books because it feels I want to say not as lighthearted as the other books, but I loved it. Like it's the only one of the three that I cried during a scene while I wrote it. And I was like, happy about it after it happened. So I'm really hoping that it lands the same way that these two do, but it's, it's a little bit of a, of a heavier feel, I think. I think, I mean, it's good to go a little bit different because I think, you know, the first two in the series also are different from Mm -hmm. each other and explore different. And now I feel like we know Thistle Grove so well that like you don't need to spend as much time going into the like we already are familiar with this space and more comfortable in it. So you can kind of dive into these deeper issues and emotions. And we're still like, well, I know where I am here Mm -hmm. feeling these things. So I'm very excited for that. Do you know when we can? Yes, January. Okay. Yes, it'll be January of next year, which is really crazy. That's (laughs) soon. That's yeah, it's cool. relatively soon. Yes. Uh, and even um, the other thing that I can say is I'm going to be doing the cover reveal of Back in a Spell next week. Uh, and I love this cover. I was very excited about this cover. Uh, and I hope it's like um, a take on the previous two covers, but it really to me evokes kind of the magic and light um, and the, because this is a, the this will grow version of a Christmas romance that happens at Yule. Because <laughs> so, I had to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yes, I must. And so I did it. Um, and so it, it has that kind of feel, I think, to the cover as well. And I, I think it's really charming and I'm super stoked about it. I am too. And now I'm going to get into some questions. Um, all right. Let's start with. So excited to see, this is from Claire. So excited to see more of Thistle Grove. Was it hard to say goodbye to Emmy and Talia as your main focus and find Issa and Rowan's different voices? Um, I cheated a little bit in that obviously Issa is Talia's sister. And so I, you know, there was a little bit of like, we, we see plenty of Talia in this story, as you know. So she's very much still a central character and then we get to see a little bit more of Emmy stepping into her role as the victor in Thistle Grove which I really wanted to show um I thought it was going to be more painful because I really loved the two of them together but 
I felt Issa's voice so quickly. Like that first line, as soon as I had it, I was like, boom, I know what this is. Like it wasn't, sometimes I struggle with first lines because I really need them to be right. When I start writing, a, I, I can't go back and change it later. Like it has to be the one that's going to really kick everything off for me. And hers, I woke up thinking it and I was like, that's the one we're going to do this. And then as soon as I had her, I knew who I wanted Rowan to be, to be this like, counterpoint who was going to balance her and challenge her in interesting ways and so once I got into it I was like I actually in some ways like writing this better because she felt more familiar to me than Emmy like Emmy was lovely but she wasn't very much like me in most ways he says a little bit closer like I'm not anywhere near as wild as she is in most ways but I understand that kind of psychology better and so she felt very natural and organic for me to write Thank you. And thank you, Claire. So I'm going to move on to Connie's question. She says, I love the enemy to lovers trope, especially the buildup in this book. It's definitely one of those tropes that is very familiar to many. How do you keep surprising your reader with the romantic build? So it honors the trope, but also doesn't feel too predictable. Hmm. Um, what? Again, that's a really good question because all tropes are predictable, right? Like we know that they're going to end up together. But I think it has to be in the execution of their characters. Like I, you have to do a lot of that character building in advance so that you know sort of the, the ways in which they're going to tug at each other and be abrasive, but also really revolve around each other. I had also sort of the hack that I mentioned earlier, which is that their families have this like centuries long, not really feud, but discomfort between them. Um, and then we find out later that it's like really, really deeply rooted. And so it gave them this like immediate emotional texture because it wasn't just the two of them being arch enemies because they couldn't stand each other. It was like their entire ethos, like everything about the way that they perceived the world and the ways that they interacted with magic was so completely different that it let me play off of so many elements that it was I found it easier to do it that way than if you were writing contemporary enemies to lovers where it's like all you have to work with their personalities like that's all you got like I had a lot more um, foundation there to build off of and I really just like leaned heavily on it because I was like all right like maybe it's been a little bit too friendly like let's see what can we poke like we can poke the fact that they're arch enemies or we can poke something about you know that this curse is like the obvious suspects or the Abramovs is really pissed about this. Like everything about that partnership is so loaded that I feel like I, I just like stacked it for myself <laughs> to give myself a lot of material to keep people like, okay, what are they going to, you know, like get their dandered up about next? Yeah. More context to mm -hmm. their enemies. Yes, exactly. Around than just yeah. not liking each other. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Connie. And now moving on to the next question. Where do you get your witchcraft inspiration? Do you do a bunch of research or do you mostly pull from your own personal knowledge and experience? Um, I feel like I somewhat answered this, but it's fortunately, or I don't know, I guess, unfortunately for like my dad who does not think it's as cool as I do. I just really like the occult and I've always liked it since I was like 12 or 13. So I've been reading and watching shows um, and being in covens for a long time. And so a lot of the, real life inspiration that goes into this, these books is like, okay, here's how it's done. Um, and things like Gardneri and Wicca are just witchcraft that's divorced from religion. What if it were like that, but a lot cooler, like that's always sort of my, like, what if it were like this, but like the Disney version and there were no limits and everything was like sparklier, darker, just like much more dramatic than it is when you actually do it in real life, which is not to undervalue. Like there are some really beautiful traditions that do happen, but I have yet to see like ectoplasm or, fire, or fireworks happen. So uh, I mostly just do a lot of translating of the material that I already know really well. And so I haven't for this, for these books, I haven't had to do very much external research. Every once in a while it'll be stuff like if I'm looking for a specific crystal or like a specific herb for a spell, then I will look things up just to refresh my memory or I don't like know all those um, particulars, but a lot of it is already stuff that I'm relatively familiar with. Yeah. It's that Salem experience. Yeah. It's, only, <laughs> it's trips, exactly what it is. <laughs> all those trips to Salem. And I have got it. Yeah. <laughs> this is from Emmy Lou. She says, does book three focus on another part of the wheel of the year, which I think you mentioned it's the Yule. 
So it's Yule. I love Yule. Yule is a beautiful, beautiful holiday. It's just so pretty the way that it's done in a lot of the neo pagan traditions. There's a lot of candles and water, and it's just this very luminous atmosphere. And so I really, um, I especially enjoy doing it because Nina's like, I hate winter. It sucks. This is the worst. And then she really comes around to it by the end of the book. And I also don't really like winter, but I love the idea of like, the spark against a lot of darkness and so that book really felt like there's a lot of light imagery and um kind of metaphors for emotional development that have to do with yule and and with that kind of interplay between light and dark also like if you've just if you've recently been broken up with the holidays yeah. generally aren't <laughs> Aren't the best time of year, especially if like your wedding was supposed to be a winter wedding, which is the case for her, where her fiance was like, I want a winter wedding. And she was like, oh, I hate it, but I love you. So I guess we'll do that. So it's like almost exactly a year to the day where they were supposed to be married in this like lavish fur trimmed winter wedding that didn't happen for her. And now it's Yule and everything's the worst. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. She well, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to reading it and I can't wait till January. And I think I'll call Bonnie back to wrap up our good time. Yeah, absolutely. Hello. Thank you for such a wonderful conversation. Um, I haven't read the book yet myself, but I'm really excited um, to get my hands on it. Um, I think one of my coworkers has an advanced copy, so I'm probably going to borrow that, um, even though it's out now. So there's no need for the, the advanced copy. Um, So I'm very excited and thank you, Lana, for joining us. Thank you, Rachel, for joining us as well. Um, And thank you to our audience uh, for for hanging out on this Tuesday evening. Um, I'm going to drop a link in the chat. Bear with me one second. Um, So we're so excited to have everybody here. Um, The link that I just dropped in the chat Uh, If you haven't ordered a copy of either Rachel or Lana's books already, you can get it through that link. And if you order um, by 9 a.m. tomorrow, uh, we do have some signed book plates, which is very exciting. Um, We got them in the mail yesterday. Uh, Lana also has like a very beautiful signature. Do I really think you guys? Yeah, I really liked it. Yeah, (laughs) I thought it was nice. (laughs) I'm glad you liked Um, it. Every time I'm like, I'm a fraud. This is so good. (laughs) We've gotten some really just like sad authors like signed book plates in the past and yours has like nice flair and personality um so it's good in my book and I've seen a lot of these uh I've seen a lot of signed book plates um but yeah so definitely everyone feel free to click on that link and I'll drop it one more time just to make sure everyone sees it um but yeah feel free to check that out if you'd like to order a copy of the book and other uh, or Rachel's <laughs> book Cackle um, and otherwise thank you all so much for joining us tonight and again thank you Lana thank you Rachel happy for such book a- birthday Lana yes. so excited with the dragon goblet yes cheers do it cheers cheers to awesome. Issa and Rowan and more time in Thistle Grove thank you so much Rachel thank you so much Bonnie this is wonderful I'm so glad to have launched it with you this is perfect oh It was such a lovely evening. Thank you both so much. And everyone, 